Hello and welcome to Decoding Academia from Decoding the Gurus, the podcast where we normally look at gurus, but sometimes look at stuff that is interesting and good or sort of academic. And in this episode, we're not looking at a academic article or some news story that is related to a study or something like that. We are talking about the book Immune by Philip Detmer from Kurzgesagt, the creator and lead writer of Kurzgesagt. He has made a book which is all about the immune system. The subtitle is A Journey into the Mysterious System That Keeps You Alive. Quite a dense book and... um, as you would expect of a Kurzgesagt product, if you have the physical version or the online version or whatnot, it's full of very, very nice illustrations. And there are little videos on Kurzgesagt, which demonstrate the processes that it covers. I was reading it. Matt, this this actually is a kind of uh, a snake eating its own tail scenario because you originally introduced me to the Kurzgesagt channel, right? Mm-hmm. Or Kurzgesagt, however you pronounce it, that channel and encouraged me to watch it with my son, which I did. And he very much enjoys it, though I enjoy it equally. Um, and then I came across this book and ordered it. And then eventually, having had it sit on my shelf for like a year, started to read it. And then I wouldn't shut up about it. And I encouraged you to download the audiobook. So we both... Yep. And they consumed it simultaneously, but it's a cross pollinization. I feel this is a team effort. Yeah, you're quite correct. Definitely is. Definitely is. Um, yes, and I, then you got me raving about it, which encouraged you to finally finish reading it. And now we've both arrived at the same. <laughs> That's the it. Same we are in a way, Matt. We are like the little cells in the immune system activated by various <laughs> signals coming in, getting us we're tired we've read a lot of chapters and then somebody says and then it excites our chemical processes and back we go so it's a it's a pretty hefty book as well i will say that yeah it's it's a popular science book um it's not an academic um you know manuscript because chris if you and i were reading a like a proper academic technical manuscript about this topic we wouldn't understand it it's really really complicated you and i uh, interested uh, amateurs, lay in people, lay yeah. people, yeah. yeah, doctors, people who have gone through medical training would uh, recognize a lot of this. And uh, but even then, you know, there are people who are immunologists for a reason because the first thing that you quite quickly pick up in this book is that like it's amazingly complex and there's a lot of interlocking systems that like it is perfectly reasonable to dedicate your entire career to understanding some component of the immune system and you can get Nobel prizes for that and deservedly so like it's a it's an interesting thing but before before we get to that matt maybe it's worth giving the like big picture reactions before going into like the you know specific details about stuff Mm. so what is what do you think about this book overall yeah look i you know we really recommend this book to everyone and this this kind of book um i want to keep looking for more books like this i absolutely love them as you said it's an incredibly technical and complicated topic that is nevertheless very well understood by modern molecular biology modern modern immunology so there is so much information there but you really need uh somebody to act as a intermediary i think to in order for people like you and me and 99 percent of the population to wrap your head around how it works but you know it can be done like as they emphasize in the book you can have a good understanding of a topic like this at a a certain level uh, you know, a certain yeah. level of abstraction, shall we say. You know, it doesn't mean you're qualified to have your own special opinions about whether or not mRNA vaccines are good or not. Certainly not, right? No. But it, but it, but you can get a good gut understanding of of how these things work, and it is absolutely fascinating. Um, one little comment from me, just a broad sort of comment, Chris, is that 
some of the reactions we we get to the podcast, which and, and they often come from people who who, who like the podcast, who who appreciate yeah. the content, but you know they were maybe a former fan or or felt that whatever Jordan Peterson had valuable things to say, and and the comment is well. Um, what do you suggest? Like, who who should we be listening to um, for the getting of wisdom? You know, if if, yeah. if if you guys are saying that Jordan Peterson isn't so great with this content, uh, you know, what should we be doing? And in in a way, I, I never really had a good answer for this, other than just I don't know, you figure it out for yourself. But yeah, I mean, after after thinking about it, I realized like if you like you don't get you don't get, I think, a sense of like, a, like I don't know what wisdom is really, right? It's kind of one of those spooky words, right? But if it means like just like a general appreciation for the world in which we live and then I think the, the best advice you could give a young person or, or anybody is, is to read and to consume content very wi- widely on a wide range of topics. It could be something about diplomacy in the hmm. the Mendic system. It could be a historical thing, or it could be a biological thing like this, or it could be um, about physics. And and just inform yourself with factual, like real knowledge on a wide range of areas. And I think somehow all of that goes together to make you maybe a wiser person as the years go by eventually. But it doesn't generally come from people who are saying this is the secret to life. I've figured it out, and I'm going to give give it to you. It comes from reading like a lot of different books uh like this that's, that's yeah and I, I would say like this book is a, a, even though it is like a kind of popular science book it's in much more detail about a very specific subject right it's just about the immune system and all the different cells and all different systems that make it up but the author philip detmer who's obviously spent a very long time as he discusses in the introduction like kind of gathering the material and and converting it into a way that people could understand but he's very clear throughout when he's simplifying things and he's even providing a level of detail which is much more detailed than almost anybody that isn't an immunologist will uh you know have encountered before but he is very clear that he's oversimplifying things at times or he's kind of uh, you know, presenting things in a way that makes it easier to understand and that the the specific terms that are used are hard to remember and that's okay. And and I think part of it is honed through the experience of making Kurtzkasak that the book is very good at like going through complicated topics, trying to emphasize the bits that you need to remember and then providing summaries that recount, right? Like it's it's very good in a pedagogic way that it's organized but there's that uh and the kind of acknowledgement of limitations right of the author of the reader that it never makes you forget so it is saying you know you're going to be informed about things but always you know remember the level that you're receiving at but that is very good and then the other thing is there's been a couple of books that i've read in my life that have opened up a kind of different perspective at looking at myself about looking at humanity or that kind of thing, right? And it's rare. And I do think that you have to be a little bit careful when you get that aha feeling that you're not just like kind of rushing in to yeah. overinterpret and, you it's know, easy get to, it. it's easy to over extrapolate from that. Yeah. Some persuasive, well-written book. Right. Mm-hmm. But I think that applies more to books that attempt to explain human history and society, right? Because yeah. they're they're giving you like the key. Well, if I could interrupt for a second, I, I reckon that's a really good point. And I, I think the little red flag is, you know, we just covered Yuval Noah Harari and we talked about sapiens and guns, germs and steel. And there are popular nonfiction books where the author sets out to sort of deliberately give you those sort of aha moments like wow i can yeah. see i can see the golden thread that ties everything together you know and that's inc- that's an incredibly satisfying feeling it sells books i understand why they want to give it to you but you should be a little bit suspicious when those those feelings are coming a little bit too easily or it's a little bit too pat now a book like this while mm. it does like you said give you that that aha moment that's very satisfying it doesn't set out I, I think to do it, I, for, for me, it, it's very different. It's a different kind of book from 
those other ones. Yeah. And in the other book that springs to mind that we've talked about off the podcast that uh, achieved a similar effect at a younger age was The Selfish Gene, which introduced me to looking at things evolutionarily and from a gene's perspective, right? And and like most things, there's been various criticisms made of the particular perspective there. But I think in general, it is absolutely true that when you start to recognize processes of evolution and what they mean for the way the body, you know, constructs itself and motivations for people and so on, that it is a significant change to, instead of looking at people purely as individuals, like seeing them as collections of genes that are, you know, uh, through processes of natural selection and, and evolution, looking to replicate themselves in the next generation. And there is a dehumanizing aspect to that in a way, but it's also humanizing in the fact of recognizing that humans are just a part of nature, just an animal, which like all the other animals is seeking to you know, send its genetic information into the next generation. And that that doesn't mean that that explains every single action that people take. In fact, not because in a way we are the only species that has divorced itself, not entirely, of course, but from being controlled purely by our evolutionary drives, right? So when I read The Selfish Gene, it made me very interested in human evolution and biological processes and like evolutionary theory. Um, and it, it did make me think that this was an important way to consider about uh, you know the the psychological makeup of humans and and comparative psychology, looking at you know related species and whatnot. And immune is the same thing in terms of making you aw- acutely aware of the biological nature of yourself, right? Of this thing that makes you up. And more importantly, how much is occurring which you are completely unaware of and which is exceedingly complex, exceedingly important for your daily life and the quality of your life, but you have utterly no awareness of and have inherited through evolutionary biological systems. So that to me is very interesting. And it's not the trite observation of, you know, the kind of gut biome. There's lots of helpful bacteria and so on and microorganisms that are Um, potentially helpful it's more that no you the cells that make you up the things which are inside your sack of meat and bone and blood are engaged in their own worlds and their own little motivations and the book does a very good job of laying out you know in a way that people can understand like cells responding to an invasion and like repelling invaders and this kind of thing but it's also constantly reminding you these cells don't have consciousness. They don't have a personality. They are, you know, doing this through chemical processes, which are not, don't require consciousness to operate, but we can explain it in a way, you know, when we explain them in a analogies, it's helpful for people, but that's, that's incredible because when you find out about the complexity of the systems involved, it's almost inconceivable that it could exist without some you know guiding will setting all these little uh forces into the the right configuration but that isn't we know that evolution can do that when you give it enough time and you know that's that to me is a very powerful perspective from previous experience with creationists and intelligent design advocates and kind of debates about, you know, uh, science versus religion. I'm aware that they often focus on the complexity of biological systems, right? Like the bacteria flagellum, all the different parts that need to interact. And at a more macro scale, what good is half a wing, right? Like how could it evolve through all these different things or the human eye? But what this book made me aware is like, those people are amateurs. They could focus on the immune system to such any portion of the immune system is so unbelievably complex and such a like fascinating system 
that they could really have used irreducible complexity at any of those, right? Because the if you presented the details, it would give the kind of impression that this level of complexity is impossible to generate through natural processes. But the fact is, it it isn't, right? It, it occurs in all animals and and uh, including single cell animals doing complicated things. So yeah, that that just to me is the big picture is that it's a it's a very very thought provoking book and it did make me think about myself and my body in a way that I wasn't accustomed to doing until I read the book, which is a very good thing. Yes, I, I agree. <laughs> um, no, it, it gave me those aha moments too. And the uh, same, it changed my perspective a little bit. Um, like, you know, I was aware uh, on a, at a, you know, at an abstract level that, you know, the, I was a very complicated molecular machine, fundamentally, right, yeah. <laughs> or ma- made up of billions of those. All the people, not so much, but you, yes. <laughs> <laughs> yes, me specifically, yeah. not you, the listener, obviously. But, you know, it really helps to actually have it fleshed out. Like, you can, you can go, oh, yes, it's all very marvelous. You know, we can, we can yeah. talk and walk and whatever. But it's not till you go through the details that you realize how truly marvelous it is and um like you i had those sort of change in those changes in perspective from reading books like the selfish gene and you also made me think of um some books by eo wilson that i read about insect societies Um, you know the field of sociobiology just like a lot of things in evolution got wrapped up in controversies and stuff when you start applying it to to human societies but put that aside if if you read his books about the social insects it, it, yeah. it really does. It's, it's similar to Dawkins' extended phenotype thing, which is you, you realize that the boundary of an organism doesn't necessarily end at its skin. <laughs> that, yeah. you, know, you know what I mean? That you can have these extended organisms like an ant colony that share DNA and so on. And, and you just go, it just gives you those moments where you go, whoa, you know, I, didn't, <laughs> I haven't thought about stuff like that before. Um, so similarly, it wasn't from actually reading anything. It was from doing that computer simulation where I actually... Like I coded up a simple genetic algorithm, and and I, and I gave it, um, you know, a simple game to play, which was the iterated prisoner's dilemma. And then I watched the population of organisms, <laughs> it, which were so simple, just a string of bits, ones and zeros, evolve. And I watched the the population dynamics over time, and you know, it, it again, it just these they give you these sort of insights, which you. It, it just, I don't know, they stay with you. Um, so, um, yeah, it doesn't happen as often as it should, but uh, I, um, I, really, I really value them. So with this one, I mean, what a, I, I found the metaphors like super helpful. And, and you know, we, we often ding the gurus for, for being too heavy with the metaphors because they, they spin up a totally speculative metaphor and then they, they sort of build their reasoning from that, which is totally yeah. the wrong way to use one. The right way to use metaphors is the way um, the Kurzgesagt guy uses them in this book, because he 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 he. It's very clear they are metaphors simply to help you understand and nothing more. You know, describing it as like a your body is like a like a police state, a paranoid police state um, that is totally xenophobic and stuff. Um, like these are good metaphors, I think, for for communicating what it's all about. Yeah, and you know, there's. One thing that's like a principle that's hugely important for all of the immune system. (laughs) And it it actually speaks to a little bit of a, you know, debate that we've had with different gurus, particularly Sam Harris, um, when he's uh, been on the show, about it's very, very important for the cells to distinguish uh, between self and not self. Yep. This is supposed to be here. This is not, right? This is a crucial distinction Mm. for the immune system. And and a large part of it is just like mm, correctly identifying which is which. And Chris, sorry, before you move on from that, Mm. like like this was one of those little sort of deep (laughs) moments I got, which was that it made me appreciate that, yes, at a very fundamental level, right, um, an organism in the world has has got this challenge um, that it, it needs to interact with the world around it. Environment. Right. Yeah, it's environment. Um, it, it needs to it needs to re- it needs to eat and it needs to excrete basically. Um, yeah. So um, so it's but it's got a problem because in doing so it it has to have these permeable 
boundaries. Yeah. It, it, it can't just build like a, like a permitive protective shell around itself and not interact with the outside world. We have to. But, that, but the problem is, is the outside world is full of stuff that is not you. <laughs> and when that stuff yeah. gets in and, and, is, and is poodling around your body or even a cell's with inside a cell mem- membrane, then bad things can happen, especially given that there's a whole bunch of other organisms in the world that are, are trying to eat and excrete as well, and they'll just treat you as another environment in which to do so. So the immune system, yeah, as you say, is tasked with this job of, of policing these boundaries. Yeah, and that, you know, I know that it's talking about different levels of analysis, right? Because I know that like Sam Harris, for example, wouldn't say, well, this distinction is important when it comes to immune cells that distinguish between self and, and external self. But my point is that there are so many cells and things active in your body and they have some particular mission, right? Or some role that they play. And it can also include that, they kill themselves, right? They, they have processes, which are the processes of life, which they use up in order to protect the other cells in the body or to, you know, to, to do what they're tasked with doing. But like when you start thinking about that, and especially when you're seeing it described, you know, in analogies with like little different units and whatnot, you realize like, right, but these are all components of you but they're they're doing different things and for you know if you take their eye perspective they're blowing their themselves up and not reproducing anymore to like service you know another component of you so like in that system when you start talking about a self and you are talking about you know like you said the kind of barrier of the things encased in the wall of skin around it but that is not at the level of the autobiographical construction of self from the electrical impulses that are firing around in your neurons. That's, that's like all different, right? So yeah. it's kind of, it just makes you aware that the, the body is comprised of so many things which are, you know, it, it doesn't have to be conscious. It's just that they're following their own little, you know, programming roles and things to do. And that, if you were to meditate on that quite a lot, I think it could have an effect of like shifting your perception of yourself as a unitary, you know, mm-hmm. thing. Uh, and Buddhists actually famously did this, or various other introspective uh, like traditions as well, where when they wanted people to loosen the sense of self, they got them to like, you know, lie down with dead bodies or hang around graves or look at like wounds on people and stuff to make people fixate on how much they are, you know, bags of meat and like oozing, full of oozing liquids. And so they wanted people to focus on that. But I, I think that this kind of book is achieving the same effect because like you said, the notion, there's a, there's a picture and I, I mentioned it on a different, um, like, uh, episode that we had but there's a picture early in the book that is saying your body is a tube right Mm -hmm. and it's it's showing the food coming in the mouth going down a big long tube and exiting right at the other side and in that the various parts of the body have to remove the nutrients and you know exchange gases and all that kind of thing but if you think about the human body in that way and you think of a worm for example you can see there is a, you know, a connective line uh, that it is what you talked about, like exchanging nutrients with the environment around and having a central processing unit that is helping you orientate yourself around the environment to encounter the kind of uh, things that you want to and avoid the things that you don't, right? And this, it lines up with the Kevin Mitchell perspective about the agency. And I, I just, I find that a very interesting thing to think yeah. out. And it doesn't mean that human culture is completely irrelevant, that poetry isn't significant, that your personality and you know all the, the beauties of fiction and civilization are not important. But just at a fundamental level, you are a big you tube. <laughs> <laughs> a meat bag, yes. Uh, and and it's a, a tubular one. Yeah, that's right. I mean, like it breaks down, like we have, we have natural ontological categories, 
right? They go, this mm. is me. That's you. You know, that's the desk, you know, and, and th these, this is fine. Day-to-day -day life, they're, they're useful and helpful, but they are heuristics. And they're, the definition of a, a, yourself or a body general, an animal body generally, is, is actually a little bit permeable and it gets quite fuzzy around the edges because on one hand it makes sense, but on the other hand, you know, the inside and the outside, you've got the outside in, inside you, uh, as, as you said, with your digestive system, your stomach, you can quite easily think of that as a bit of the outside that just happens to be kind of managed <laughs> by by your body and the same goes for your lungs right yeah apparently yeah. you've got like hundreds of square feet or meters of 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 area basically in in your lungs which is all there to to basically do the oxygen uh reaction um and, and that presents a massive vulnerability um a massive um yeah. exposed surface to the outside likewise the definition of what's you and what's not you the, the immune, this immune system book really makes you think about that because when you know you've got some bits of food floating around your your stomach, all right? Is that is mm. that you? At what point does it become part of you? Uh, well, okay, you might say if that's when it gets absorbed into a cell and gets turned into a protein or something like that. But there yeah. are cells that become cancerous that suddenly have decided to not really play ball anymore yeah. and not be part of the cooperative uh, multicellular body anymore. And in a real sense, they're not really you anymore. Um, likewise, cells, you know, uh, eat you know, or consume resources and excrete, and those those excretions are basically waste and need to be taken away, which again the immune system is involved with. And you know, they become not you. You know, so so a large and as well as that, we know that there are huge populations of communal bacteria uh, and and viruses, I suppose, happily happily. Um, living inside us and tolerated to some degree in some areas of, of yeah. our body, and you know they're not us either. Like to 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 them, we're like a, a planet. We're we're a rainforest or an ecosystem. So you can have this sort of slightly giddying, um, um, vertigo-inducing moments when you you a book like this encourages you to think about yourself not as like a unitary. Uh, thing but rather to go oh yeah we're actually in a way we're a bit like an ant colony but this but we're also a bit like a rainforest you know and i think the, those are those they're are deep all true. yeah they're all true yeah, yeah. <laughs> and it's, it's the same way that like there's so many processes described in the book and you know the, the on a broad level you have the innate immune system and the adaptive immune system and the adaptive immune system being in some respects like the more complicated more targeted one the one that lets you deal with specific viruses and bacteria and we'll talk a bit about the processes involved there but it's the thing which is so impressive to me is that these systems you can see they have evolutionary history right you you're kind of hinted at various parts about how they may have came to be originally in simpler cells. And you can see, you know, different kinds of cells that could have been co-opted into like having uh, symbiotic relationships with others, right? And then ending up like forming the, the kind of grounds for systems that are in your body. But even in that level, like there was this part where it's talking about the innate immune system. And there you have tons of things, right? You have neutrophils, macrophages, dendritic cells, all different things going around. And some of them are, well, most of them, in fact, are also interacting with the adaptive immune system. But there's this part called complement, which is mostly just proteins, right, floating around in the liquid inside your body, which is there as a kind of destructive force, right? Um, mm -hmm. And that has all these different little protein shapes in it. Uh, I can't remember how many there was. It's like 30 or something like that. But in any case, the bit I remember being like, my God, was that it was talking about this one part of the complement that attaches itself to the outside of a bacteria, right? Um, the C3A and C3B, right? But, but this one part of the complement has a, a kind of, you know, a, a shape that allows it to plug into the outside of bacteria. But then the other side of it 
kind of constructs uh, like a tower, which then builds more <laughs> complement or recruits more, or it's kind of like creating this big structure. And then it, it starts doing something else. And that's just like one little tiny component of the complement system, of the innate immune system, and all the other systems aren't even discussed. And that's the simple one. <laughs> that's <laughs> the one. But it looks like, if you look at yeah. the diagrams for it, it's like, that's such a complex structure being constructed that, you know, if you were a religious person, it would be easy to be like, right, well, how the F could that happen without, you know, some guiding hand? But it doesn't, that's the beauty of it. It doesn't need a guiding hand. It doesn't need to have any mind that that's what it wants to do. It just has to be, you know, the kind of processes which have built up through evolution. Yep. So, evolution. yeah, that yeah. that is mind-blowing because you could spend, I guess, a whole year, multiple years studying that one mechanism, and people have. And I, I think, you know, Nobel Prizes are awarded for understanding various parts of it, but it, it's just such a tiny component, and it's so infinitely complex that you, it, it did blow my mind in a way to be like, Damn, and that's the stupid part of the immune system, or the you know the relatively non-targeted, um, like yep. you know, all-purpose defense system. Yeah, yeah. That, I mean, I was um, I was ignorant of just how many different parts of the immune system there were, how many sort of independently operating, and I'm sure they evolved independently as well. Um, yeah. And you know, there's a lot. You know, just by the by, there's a lot of things like that that happen in the brain and other. I presume in other parts of the body as well. I'm, I mainly know about the brain, but there are yeah. there are lo there are lots of systems that sort of act in parallel to sort of do the same thing. So, for instance, like you know, blind sight. You know, this this phenomena of sort of seeing something but not really being aware of it, and that's because we've actually got multiple like visual streams feeding mm. feeding in and they evolved at different times and that's kind of how evolution works it's just kind of it, it adds new things but it doesn't it doesn't have this need for sort of elegance like to like oh okay well, we've got this new thing now so we'll just use that we'll get rid of we'll get rid of the old thing no it's quite happy to have like seven different things doing the same um function or and then or complementing each other um so i didn't know that and the other thing that well one thing i did know but this made me think of it reading the book again was just like why the world is such a dangerous place <laughs> like why oh, yeah. like why the world is absolutely covered in viruses and back back bacteria all of which want to eat your face and it, one thing that he, he mentions is how we had billions of years of evolution in fact the, the vast amount of time that you know organisms have been on earth long before people or mammals or even multicellular organisms came along there was almost certainly Mm. Not not only back single celled organisms, bacteria, uh, but also viruses and viruses yeah. and bacteria. Like the vast majority of viruses aren't after you; they're after bacteria, and the vast enough, and bacteria are, are tr always trying to guard themselves against viruses. So they've been fighting this evolutionary arms race, like with evolution occurring across untold trillions of uh, organisms across the world for billions of years. And that's why they're such dangerous little morphos. And yet viruses are incredibly s simple, like in terms of mm. structure in some respects, right? That such that there's debates about whether they can be classified life. as life. Yeah, <laughs> that's right. Because they don't, they don't have any um, biological functions until they interact get with... into a cell or a bacteria so, yeah yeah so you could think of them as just a complicated molecule um with some interesting effects but they're certainly prone to evolution and actually that reminds me too sorry we're going to approach this in a random way but i think that's yeah, yeah just in that's interesting right. we're like the immune system we're coming out of <laughs> all the different <laughs> times different thing. this is our pedagogical approach you know? <laughs> <Yeah>. no. <laughs> the other aspect which i think is pretty mind-boggling and i imagine it would be the same thing if you started looking at about the complexity of the brain and you know the how neurons interconnect and all that kind of thing was discussing adaptive immunity right and how when the body encounters a bacteria or a, a virus and how it produces the response to it which is probably the response that a lot of people associate with immunity, you know, the, the kind that the vaccines help with, where there are specific uh, antibodies and specific like kind of cells released to deal with it. But the actual process by which that happens is insanely complex and 
involves like so many systems that it were by even when you have a particular kind of cell activated like T cells or B cells that you know the the right ones are, are being uh, like getting the cell from the dendritic cells they're getting you know exposed to the right antigen then you you have them those cells then themselves going through a process of like selection within various organs right where they are there's so many different ones produced but they're constantly tested if they can detect the difference between like self and non-self and if they don't they're murdered right like so mm -hmm. they describe it, the phalmus as like the murder university right that they have to graduate and 99 percent of them don't but just that so many redundancies not redundance but multiple systems whereby the immune system activates but it is aware or it's not aware like the, the language is hard to say but it it like it is so dangerous to yourself that it has to take all these safety precautions to make sure mm. that only cells that can yeah. be deactivated only cells that can identify you are yeah. are like heated up and that yeah. involves things being killed and then being reabsorbed and stuff so it's just it's such a like there's so much redundancy but it's not redundant because if it wasn't there you would uh, like it, you would kill yourself in one yeah. day right and that's what I a lot of autoimmune system, uh, like diseases do but yeah that runs with one of the other little insights i got which is it doesn't really make sense to talk about strengthening your immune system as in making it more aggressive or more powerful because it's actually a finely balanced dynamic yeah you system. don't want it <laughs> no really? no <laughs> one way in which you can see how you don't want an immune system that's too strong because obviously there's autoimmune diseases and the gurus talk about them a lot. <laughs> yeah, they do, don't they? But when you feel sick, when you catch a virus, you've got a flu and, and you're feeling a bit poorly, then all of those feelings that you're, you're experiencing, none of them are coming directly from the effects of the virus or the bacteria that is mucking around inside your body. That's yeah. this was a little insight because if you if you were so infected, if there were so many of of the little bacteria or viruses that you could actually feel their direct effects, you would be dead, right? Or or, or not far off it. You'd be very what, unwell. <laughs> like incredibly unwell. What what you're feeling is is the actions of your immune system, which you know, and, and the, the inflammation and the raising of the temperature and all of the those those nasty feelings. Are all side effects of of your immune system doing its thing, and if you get it, and, and we saw this with COVID nineteen, um, where you had a cytokine storm and so on, when the immune system is off is off balance and is is waging its nuclear war against the intruders in the sort of paranoid xenophobic way, it wants to stomp them as quickly yeah. as possible. It, it can kill you um, as uh, as easily as the the virus can. Yeah, and I think that is one thing that. Uh, you can tell that a lot of the gurus and health optimizers don't fully, they, they don't appreciate this. Like they, so many of them could benefit from reading this book because it's clear that a lot of them think about inflammation or pus or that kind of thing as being something produced by an invading toxin in your body, which shouldn't be there. But most of those things are your immune system reacting to an outsider like the inflammation is designed to restrict the bacteria or virus act activities and the you know the pus very often is the dead bodies of various parts of your immune system that have that have you know been fighting the battle but like from the outside to us it looks like something got in made us blow up red and then start leaking or you know orange foul smelling fluid that we usually don't mm. have so we're kind of like oh that thing has got inside and is now doing that and that that is it is doing that but not those symptoms are not that right no, most of the no, time those, like you say it's your body those symptoms are an indication of uh, the immune system doing what it's supposed to be doing um most of the time i mean but before before we move on i think um one of the questions this book encourages you to ask yourself is why is the immune system so aggressive like why is it so intolerant of of yeah. other right why does it want to come down on it like a like a ton of bricks and why 
And to, to the extent that it actually has to be careful not to go too hard because if it, it's got to get the balance just right because it's, it's basically fighting a nuclear war, burning the village in order to save it inside your own body. And the answer mainly is, is about exponential growth. And I think exponential growth comes, it operates on both sides here. We've got it because on one hand, one of the amazing powers of both viruses and bacteria is that they can reproduce incredibly quickly, far more much quickly than humans, much quicker <laughs> than humans. God, and then you've got to send them to university. Then you've got to pay them <laughs> yeah. money. You've got to give them money so they can live. And trust me, it takes, <laughs> it's a big deal, but, but they don't have to deal with any of that, right? They just boop, boop, boop. exponential growth. You get thousands of them um, within an hour from a single one potentially. So, so that's the danger, right? Even though, the present level of bacteria that could have infected the little cut in you could be negligible, right? It's just, it's no big deal at all. It, within a very short period of time, it, it, it could be, it could be such that it would completely over, overwhelm you. But on the other hand, the immune system, like why, why do we get sick and it usually takes us like a few days or a week to sort of get yeah. better? Like why do, why doesn't the immune system just jump in there and, 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 it and could do, do its it, job? Why doesn't it do it so quickly? Yeah. 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 And, and, you know, I didn't understand that before reading this book and, and now I do, which is as he takes us through, we've got a, basically a library inside ourselves and by those T cells, I think, and also yeah. B cells have, have basically that there are a few examples of all the different proteins that, that you could, you could possibly manufacture. Um, yeah. that could possibly exist in a, in a bacteria or a virus. And those are like the keys that enable it to, to recognize the enemy. But it doesn't, there are so many different ones in this universe of possibilities that it can maintain no more than a few examples in the library. So what's going to happen is we won't go through all the technical details, but basically the, the, it has to take that information, a dendritic cell, I believe, has got to take that information from the location of, it's got to absorb one of the enemies take that information off to your arms factories, um, find the correct one, which produces the correct kind of uh, um, antigens, is it? Oh, uh, no, the antigens are the ones that it recognizes. It recognizes. It uses. That's like the little bits of the bacteria or whatever that it breaks off and shows. Yes, and so then, it's manufacturing yeah. antibodies of, of some kind probably. But you can see why it takes a while because that because they're not everywhere, right? Your, your, body, your body's a big place and it's only got a few examples of this in it. So it takes, it takes a while for that for the, for the correct one to be found. And then that's got to be taken to the B cells um, who are going to manufacture these antibodies. And they, again, they only have a few specific B cells that man manufacture the correct type. And so they have to undergo an exponential growth, you know, cell dividing, you know, two, four, eight, and so on. And so that's going to take a little while. And there's a, there's a bunch of processes during that where like they, I can't remember which cell it is, but like there's ones that respond quickly to like relatively quickly, right? Get activated and they're good enough and they're mm. sent off. But yeah. another one, which goes the same kind of cell, but the, they're kind of sent to another area where they undergo like a selection process, a kind of refinement until they're much more like very specific to the pathogen that is encountered and then they they come along right but they have to go through that process yeah. of being refined like yeah. being yeah presented with more of the relevant bacteria or, or virus and and like kind of improving the whatever the thing is the receptor or the thing that like can detect the defenses that they have so it's great like idiots like us who, who can can un can understand like basic questions which which like why does it take your immune system a few days to a week or two to, to to fully to fully gear itself up to smash the virus and you know we'll we'll come to vaccines at the end i suppose but you know you could see the role that they play in shorts in, in speeding up that process hugely but the other thing that is linked to that chris which is that bacteria have got another big advantage over us as well as being able to reproduce really quickly the same with viruses is, is that they is that they all mutate incredibly quickly they all evolve you don't yeah. want humans <laughs> to do that. that would be bad. Like in some sense, there are specific cells we need to like be for the exponential processes that you're talking about. You know, we want them to be short lived and mutate, right? And and kind of present different things. But in general, you don't want your body no. to be mutating dramatically, uh, yeah. like consistently because no, no. that'll be bad <laughs> no, the, the, the strategy of most multicellular organisms like us is to have a, a, a very low rate of mutation 
so that we you evolve relatively slowly. It also takes you a long time to reproduce anyway, but you're evolving relatively slowly because you don't, because, you know, as everyone knows, the vast majority of significant mutations lead to a dr- dramatically decreased adaptiveness, right? But viruses and, and, to, and to a lesser degree bacteria, I understand, have, have a different approach, which is they don't care about all of that mutation. They, they, they mutate happily away, um, mutating at a very high rate th- because they're just producing thousands and thousands of children very quickly and they don't really care whether 80% of them, say, are non-viable. So that gives them, it's very wasteful on their part, but it does mean that they are evolving very quickly. And this is why we need an immune system because because we we are these big slow lumbering organisms evolving at a really slow rate right but dealing with an environment which which has these other tiny little buggers in it which are evolving at an incredibly fast rate so we're going to be striking new ones all the time that we've never seen before and so the the immune system is a is a like a within like a second order evolutionary process that allows an animal like us which cannot adapt quickly like the little microbes can um, to it, it basically learns in real time. Yeah. Somebody should tell Lex Friedman about this so that he can, you know, respond to Yudkowsky whenever they're talking about the slow moving tree aliens and the, you know, fast moving Lex in the box, because it's <laughs> no guarantee, right? That the fast moving Lex can, can win in that, uh, given that we are a lot slower than bacteria. But the other thing, Matt, just before we move on to like other areas, is that that thing you said about, you know, the parts of you that deal with the outside environment having to be, in some sense, like more vulnerable because they need to take in parts of the environment and they need to let things go out into the environment. So there has to be more permeability than in other parts of the system. That is very important for making you realize and that is why lots of the times that's where infections or, you know, illness comes from, right? Through the eyes, through the respiratory system. But also there's a specific circumstance in which there is an other that will enter your body and it's quite important, right? Like in reproduction and like somebody else, you know, like in when having sex, right? This is necessary for the other other genetic material to come in in order to fertilize, you know, an egg or uh, uh, or vice versa. And the, the but the the issue there is the environment cannot be so receptive, it, like the because there's still lots of sexually transmitted diseases, right? But that uh, helps you understand, right? Those environments have to be capable of allowing genetic information to pass, but it has to be very controlled like what Mm. is allowed and in one sense you don't want the immune system hyperactive for detecting other but you cannot ramp up down too much or otherwise like the bacteria don't care that that's your you know reproductive organ that's just another potential entry point and i think i read chris that the female body immune system will will basically start destroying those little sperm very yeah, quickly. yeah, it does. <laughs> it's, a race, majority so, of, so it's a race against time for them. Yeah, um, because they are other, right? They're in, they are, on one hand, they, the, they, the female body wants them, I suppose, if it wants to reproduce. But on the other hand, no, they're other. They need to be destroyed. <laughs> yeah, yeah, that's, that's interesting. And w- most of what we are talking about so far is about external pathogens, right? About bacteria and viruses that in, invade you. But... There is also the issue that the systems in your body, the reproduction of cells and whatnot, like all of the things that we're talking about, these can go awry. And one, you can have the immune system start to make mistakes or become too active and like start damaging your your cells, right? And uh, and kill you in, in various occasions from being too activated, but also your cells can like kind of end up, you know, with a copying in a way that isn't helpful to the overall organism, but is like kind of in line with what they, you know, want again, it creates this like false thing, but this notion about, you know, cancers. And the reason that they're so dangerous is mm. because they're, they're kind of labeled as self. And as a result, we have all these mechanisms where we try to quickly identify cells that are not behaving in the way that they 
should be. So, so one thing I got from that, Chris, is that like our, there are cancers getting started in our bodies all the time. All the time. All yeah. the time, right? Like at the very yeah, at this very right. moment, it's, no, it's horrifying. You are cancerous, right? There's cancers all yeah. over the shop, and they're getting detected and eliminated by your psychopathic police state. <laughs> um, yeah, you know, for, for being nonconformists all the time too. So it's okay for now. <laughs> yeah, and, and that that aspect as well about the aging that you know all of this, all of these like mechanisms. They're all these complex biological systems, right? But like things that, you know, the <laughs> learning that the, the thymus or thyroid, thyroid, is that what you really call that organ? That yeah, I think is, it's the thyroid, yeah. Yeah, that that essentially starts going downhill after your mid-20s or 30s, I can't remember, but it's early, right? Like it doesn't, it, to such that when you get older, it is all but ineffective at producing like various things that you need in your immune system. But but that being such a crucial thing that makes you more vulnerable later in life to, you know, illnesses that you would have previously been able to fight off. And it's it's just one of those things where you're kind of like helps you understand more about, you know, why you are more vulnerable as you mm. age. And a lot of it is your immune system. Like so if we wanted to live for longer and we are able to develop systems that artificially rejuvenate, you know, parts of the immune system that wear out. It is conceivable that you know people could live longer lives, and it, yeah. but it's such a complex system that the notion well, that, might be the, well, it's this, very. This is why I'm suspicious about the you know um, people that are working on well, what's the field called? Life extension. I forget. New, yeah. yeah, the, yeah. Ge the Gerion Tolit. I don't know. Whatever. There isn't just one system in our body that has an expiry date. Yeah, like no. <laughs> the thyroid's just one of them. You know, like your muscles are. You know, your muscle tone's getting, getting worse. Worn out. Yeah. So, so many things are going on, and you have to fix them all. Um, so I'm a bit suspicious. But you know, um, also you know, young children, of course, infants famously susceptible to uh, diseases and because they they have an immune system that hasn't had the chance to learn yet that feature matt uh, just to say before i forget that like it helped understand a bit about why there are certain illnesses which are more dangerous for people like in the prime of their life right because that somewhat seems uh like kind Generative. of intuitive mm -hmm. yeah because surely their immune system is more robust and you know they're they're healthy and they're able to go but the fact that in various points of life your immune system is not as likely to be so reactive can actually be beneficial because a lot of the damage can be done by reactive immune system so that was yeah that again was like oh of course right like so young kids their immune system is still booting up it's not the fact that it isn't so effective can actually be protective against certain things that might cause the immune system to go mental, uh, mm. like overproduce, you know, uh, and and harm the body. So, yeah, yeah that, that that was interesting. Yeah, absolutely. So, like one of the cool little nuggets we have to we have to mention because I know you enjoyed this too, Chris, was that um, one one of the many systems involved in the immune system is is one that is keeping an eye on cancers, but also <laughs> keeping an eye on viruses that like to and viruses are sneaky, right? Because unlike bacteria, which are kind of living between your cells, yeah, the, the, yeah. the viruses are are getting into your cells and then co-opting the cellular machine cellular machinery, and they can they can stay on the down low um, for for quite a long time. And I think it's some I forget which viruses it is. Is it is it measles? I forget. But one of the particularly nasty ones is 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 very good at at, at basically delaying the point at which it sort of ruptures the cell wall and basically you know, sends its all its little virus babies all over the shop, which will obviously trigger the immune system. So so it it kind of waits and it doesn't do that for a while and which yeah. makes it hard for the um you know macrophages and so on to to spot that there's even a problem well that that fact about like there being specialized immune cells which are going around and will kill your cells uh, like they want to see the, the important thing is like what's going on inside the cell because the cells should be doing you know normal stuff so they want to look inside in a way right and then 
if they see normal stuff happening, they're fine, and they leave the cell alone. And if they if the cell refuses to show the processes, or they see something bad going on, they destroy it, right? But that, like, one thing is that's incredible, right? The just that <laughs> notion. But then the part where you're like, right? But that is just a metaphor because it isn't like a little policeman comes up and you know opens ask the window to, ask, ask you to see your papers papers please and, and, and if you got the, and if you got the wrong papers or if you refuse to show your papers then he's going to shoot you in the head that's that's a good metaphor but how does it actually happen <laughs> yeah but the, so that thing where the like you then realize these beautiful diagrams with you know this little characterized personified thing but that's not actually it right like it's a three-dimensional world where the things are rubbing against each other and it's the connectors like kind of connecting to receptors and then causing cascades and certain kinds of chemicals and making processes come closer and stuff through, you know, processes of osmosis or whatever it is, brownie motion, I don't know, whichever. the But it's, it's that notion. There was one bit in it where it was talking about, we've been talking about, you know, the cells deciding to go here and recognizing this, but like, but you have to realize inside your body is completely dark. Nothing has, you know, <laughs> eyes. And so what are we talking about when we mean, you know, that things are deciding and seeing things and you're like, shit. <laughs> like, <laughs> it, it just said something like, you know, if there is light inside your body, you have a very big problem. Uh, so everything is in the dark. And then it's, you know, saying, so actually you should instead think about everything being covered in like noses or receptors, right? That are tasting or smelling the environment constantly and then potentially triggering actions that will move it towards different types of concentration or away from them. And you're just like, man, even all these little, you know, diagrams that are very helpful and so on, like they're not doing justice to just what a jumbled mess that is in there. And uh, yeah, so that that is very, and that's the point that you made that, you know, metaphors, these schematic diagrams, these anthropomorphizing, it's all really, really helpful as a human to kind of get your head around what is going on. But fundamentally, it is not an accurate representation yeah. because the actual representation would just be too much, too complex for your mind. It would look like a fucking alien, you know, landscape with just like things exploding and stuff all over the place. So yeah, that's all very true. But I guess in 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 the case of the um the little Stasi cells going around checking other cells' papers, he he, he does uh, give us at least a hint of the molecular mechanisms, which is that you know all all, all cells have the protocol, which is that they of of all of the little um proteins and things that they're producing inside their cells some small percentage of them randomly get basically displayed on the outside of, <laughs> yeah, of, yeah. of the cell right and 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 that provides the little molecular windows for the stasi cells to who are just like you said they can't see they're not deliberately coming up to it they're just bumping into other cells randomly but but they bump into this cell and their molecular detectors you know latch on to these on to the ones that the cells displaying and if and if they're the right kind of molecules, um, they don't they don't trigger a, a, a danger signal. Everything's fine. But there's yet another kind of <laughs> immune system cell, which again I forget the name of it. But it's specifically concerned with cells that don't display the proteins on their cell yeah. wall, and and that's because there some clever viruses have evolved to to say well if we let the cell do what it usually does which is we put the proteins on the outside then the immune system will come and kill us so 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 we won't do that right so so these so cells that are infected with these guys um don't don't show they those. kind of pull down the blinds they, they pull down the blinds they refuse to show their passport but uh, 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 the immune system's got that covered right because there's a particular cell and if they are not showing the right or any proteins if it's just smooth on the outside they go right i'm going to shoot you in the head <laughs> yeah. yeah and that, that's all of this is just so complicated so many syst interlocking systems doing it and it's so crucial to keep you alive because if they didn't do these then you could be you know overtaken by uh, an exponentially reproducing virus. You, or, you, would, you would last a matter of hours. You, you wouldn't last long. And this is why it's really important when there are diseases or illnesses that deplete your immune system, right? Because it makes you incredibly susceptible to 
infection and, yeah. um, and, and that's what's so special about AIDS, right? It it actually, you know, like um, different viruses attack all kinds of different cells. They'll, they'll quite happily eat whatever muscle cells or whatever uh, mouth lining cells. But AIDS is a bit special because it actually likes to attack specifically immune system cells. It actually likes yeah. to, to eat the immune system, and that's what makes it so horrible. So this whole thing, though, Matt, it, it, like I, I might be hammering this again, but I think it's worth referencing is uh, so you know brett weinstein was talking about i can't remember the specific details but he he made some statement with michael Shermer that you know nobody could explain why this kind of thing happens with mrna vaccines or whatever right or the immune system response like this and debunked the funk got three immunologists on who explained why brett is talking absolute shit Right, and they they explained the thing which Brett said nobody could explain. Then Brett came out with a video recently, a three hour podcast with two substackers. He put out the big guns. Put out yeah, the, he uh... didn't do the work. Like Brett himself, almost never does the kind of technical thing because he doesn't read studies or do this kind of thing. But he he can get a doctor roller get or you know some random substacker with too much time and too much confidence to like produce a prodigious amount of technical sounding information and he did that he did a three hour episode where he you know he kind of the way he presented it was he was explaining how those experts got everything wrong and how their answers didn't really answer anything right but he acknowledged in that some mistakes that he'd made in various things where he'd used the wrong word and he wanted to say you know i said this but i meant this and dan wilson from debunk the funk has responded right and he said on the one hand he said he could go through and just show how the whole video, the whole three hours is just littered with mistakes, errors. They didn't even read the papers that he, you know, that, that, that are referenced by the relevant experts. And he is going to do that or, or he'll have like a debate with Brett. But that's, that's not the point. The point is that during that, he points out some of the errors that Brett made in like the terminology he was using or what he was talking about. And Brett presents it as being like minor mistakes, you know, I referred to a T cell and I meant something else. I, you know, I meant B cell or whatever. And if you don't know immunology, it sounds like, well, it's not that important. You know, he's just talking about different types of cells. But if you are an expert, it makes it clear he doesn't understand a thing that he's talking about. You know, he's talking about processes which are completely different, systems which are not relevant to what he's referencing or just just like really really fundamental errors it would be like someone i think the equivalent would be like someone talking to you matt and they're describing like doing a factor analysis but they're actually discussing a t-test and then yeah. they say well you know they're all statistical tests and you're like right but that, that those are not the same yeah. right the, 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 fact, the fact that you make that mistake it, it's not, it's not a slip of the tongue it's it's indicative that you have literally no idea what you're talking about yeah exactly and that's that's the thing is like one thing that struck me about this is all these thousands upon people who spent hours and hours listening to Brett Weinstein and his chuckle-headed friends discuss the virus discuss immunity discuss the mrna vaccines and there's no useful information in that. It's all, even the information that is correct or relevant is misleading because they're presenting it in a way very often that is performative, which is not for people to understand, but like kind of to marshal for their rhetorical argument. And all of them would be better off, one, watching Kurzgesagt like videos, but two, have listening to none of Brett and just reading the book, <laughs> right? Just reading a book like this, or I'm not even saying that they would need to invest all the, the time, but just spending time to actually try to understand the immune system, you know, listening to Twave, listening to This Week in Virology, uh, I mean, or relevant experts discussing these kind of systems. It would help because all the things in this are about, you know, cytokine storms and about, you know, the respiratory illnesses and and why there, there are some sections which are specifically about COVID, but the whole, the whole thing applies. And it's just this depressing fact that there are so many people who would, I think, equally be amazed 
and they have the energy to spend hours, you know, listening to people talk about the immune system, but they get sucked into like Brett Weinstein or Scott Adams giving them information as opposed to, you know, Philip Detmore, who is not an immunologist, uh, mm. but but could give you useful information or, you know, a relevant expert. So that's it's just a kind of disheartening thing that you realize that this is what actual science communication and useful information is like. And the gurus are so far away from that. And it's so focused on their personality. Philip Detmer's personality comes across in this, but it's not about him. It's about, you know, the information that he has like gathered together here. And yeah, that's just the depressing thing that people fundamentally would care more about, you know, Sam Harris's take on the vaccines or mm. Nassim Taleb's view on vaccines than <laughs> that, <laughs> that, that kind of uh, like... Rather than just educating themselves, like, you know, just, yeah. you know, and, and not sort of dipping into the technical literature and trying to wrap no. your head around, uh, you know, MRI. An individual based. study. Yeah, an individual study. I mean, like, for God's, you've, you know, it's like you're, you're starting at the top when you need to start at the bottom. And, yep. and you start with broad, simplified baby introductions like this, which nevertheless are tremendously informative to to lay people like us and actually does do you some good. The only thing you can get from, from tapping into the extremely technical, advanced, raw, bleeding edge, empirical literature is you can pick up the buzzwords, some of the technical terms, and you can string them together in a way that will bamboozle other people like you who don't know what they're talking about. And that's that's what Brett Weinstein does. <laughs> yeah, yeah, that is, that is exactly what he does. And it's similar to, I mean, there are different level skills because it would be the case, for example, somebody who is not an expert in immunology, but understands trial design and randomized controlled trials. And, you know, that could look at the design of a study and critique various aspects of it without knowing all of the technical details of the specific yep. parts of immunity that the thing is trying to look at. But even then, that requires the fundamental building block of understanding how trials are conducted, understanding how experiments are you know, done and various these, systems. And these almost- These gurus don't even have that, do they? No, and but what they do have, and this is kind of what Brett did with those two guys, is they have- various figures who can give the impression of that or do have some expertise, right? Like in most cases, a lot of the substacky people, they have some degree of expertise. Maybe they can do static statistical analysis. Maybe they are a biological engineer or something, right? Like they, you know, they've, they've worked in a lab or something like that, but in any field, you have any amount, you have a, you know, a huge amount of people and you have some people that greatly overestimate their abilities and who also, you know, have perspectives which are skewed by all different things. And they can, this is the issue that when you have so many millions or thousands of people in your audience, um, and even then they're still quite rare, but you can find technically competent people in some aspect who nonetheless are wrong in yeah. so many fundamental ways. But to a lay person, that expert plus this very fringe expert with an extreme interpretation look the same. They just look the same because yeah. you don't have the expertise to distinguish. They're, they're, uh, they're almost, Chris, like a like a very good virus that's imitating <laughs> yeah, a healthy, yeah. healthy cell. Very challenging for the immune system. Yeah, um, it, it is. So we, in a way, look, this is... <laughs> This is our. This is the galaxy brain here. Wait, are you saying we? We Chris. <laughs> we are part. Look, but I'm just saying we are a part of the social immune system against gurus, right? We are telling people how to spot their little antigens, you know, like their cells on the outside. It looks like a disclaimer, but that is, if you look subtly, it's, you know, there's something wrong with it. So that's, right. uh, that's yeah, we that's are. Right. Rejects, rejects, not self, kill. And the, yeah, yeah, and the important thing in that as well, the bit that would be worthwhile noticing is if we are uh, and flatter ourselves as part of the, you know, social immune system against hucksters and, and, and gurus, there's so many overlapping different 
systems and like gaining technical competence, like reading books which make you informed about history, about science or whatever. They are all things that help as well. You don't have to just be consuming, you know, Carl Sagan's Demon Haunted World or or listening to the coding the gurus. It, there's so many different ways you can learn, but like the viruses, the people are good at like exploiting our psychology and, and, ev- and evolve- heuristics. Yeah. Heuristics, yeah. So yeah, yeah well, like I think there is an analogy that applies, but I think you'd still be better to read immune <laughs> than rely on us. But but could right. Philip get more spot a secular guru or would he be taken in? I think he probably could. <laughs> yeah, he probably could. Probably could. Um well look, I think the final the final thought I want to leave people on is uh, just a pretty basic one, which is uh, you know, the book made it clear to me that no matter how clever we get with our vaccines, we're always going to have the uncomfortable side of them. Like they're always going to, you're going to have a kind of a sore shoulder. You're going to have a bit of a bump. You might feel a bit sick and achy for a day or two. And that's because whether it's an mRNA vaccine or a live attenuated vaccine or a subunit vaccine or something else, they all do exactly the same thing, which is to instigate an immune response. And an immune response is always going to feel a little bit unpleasant. Interesting thought, Matt, and something which just like struck me was, you know, we've commented many times that a lot of the gurus we cover, especially the anti-vaccine ones, have this deep fear about their body being penetrated by something foreign, right? Like they are, they're scared, very scared about the the chemicals out there in the world. And right. And in some way that is because of the psychology that they've inherited, right? Like of, you know, being a mammal that is potentially damaged by the environment, you know, and, and, and so on. But also there is that the fact that they don't understand the systems is why they're so scared because like the notion that you're injecting a virus into your system right like that is what they imagine like a virus or a bacteria right that that you're injecting it and it's just going to do the same thing like you're putting in the thing which you're trying to avoid what are you doing you know you're gonna damage your heart and your whole body but they they don't understand the principle that for your immune system to work, it has to be exposed to the parts of a virus that allow it to make the defense instructions. And it will not spin that up and make it so that your whole body is like overcome because it's designed to do this. Oh, it, that's right. That's right. It's had, it's had millions, if not billions of years of experience in dealing with foreign intrusions. It knows exactly what to do with it, right? It, it, it takes those, it has an immune response, it, it, it deals with the contaminants, it, it gets rid of them through the waste, and it takes note of the particular shape of the proteins and files that information away so it's ready for next time. And Yeah, and the notion that, you know, you have the cells, the dendritic cells within you that are, are essentially trying to do the same thing, right? They're, they're capturing parts of the invading pathogen breaking it up and taking it to your adaptive immune system to try and match like which parts these match up to, right? With your defense and vaccines are just kind of helping that process along without you having to have the invasion where, you know, your dendritic cells need to like take the, the jumbled up one. They give you it for free and they, mm. and, but people, because they don't understand the principles about, like the immune system, it's mm. just the fear of like the outside, yeah. the infection, yeah. the spike protein. Right? That's right. And, like it, and, it, and it doesn't matter how much um, uh, ginseng or ginger root or whatever it is, echinacea that you imbibe, the, the adaptive immune system, amazing though it is, operates on a delayed reaction. Yeah, as uh, if, if you read the book and as we sort of briefly covered, it, it just takes time for it to take the information, take it up to the, to the factories that are going to manufacture antibodies and get it back to where it needs to be and instigate those, those Wunderwaffen that are going to really blitz the virus. And if it had enough time, right, then it, it would be able to deal with anything, measles, polio, a, you, know, you name it, right? It would, it, Our it would, disease, one important thing, the disease that we haven't encountered yet on Mars, yeah. right, some yeah. pathogen, yeah. it has but, the code already to deal with it. <laughs> 
Yeah, but the fundamental thing is time. You're on a clock. And by those principles of exponential growth, which which both slows down the it takes time to go from you know just a handful of of antibodies to to produce to to the billions of them that you're going to need to actually fight the infection that the infection has a head start right it's it's already doing the exponential growth thing yeah. and and that's why you know forget about strengthening your immune system um, what you, what you want to do is give your immune system a head start on that on it's basically a race in exponential uh, reproduction and you know that's that's why you should go get vaccinated <laughs> get vaccinated but, but similarly Matt, it shows how the kind of way that people think is wrong because like the way the anti-vaxxers think is if you got like say 15 or 16 jabs from you know the like uh, vaccination that mm. this is overloading your system that you're you know, you're now yeah. so full of toxic particles that you wouldn't have naturally got. But what they don't understand is you <laughs> it's you're already, Yeah, that, it's literally nothing. And there are, you know, there are going to be memory cells produced, but it's not like they are taking over. In fact, your own library, which already contains all of the necessary components to make, you know, the, the, the correct, like, an adaptive response, they're all right there. So it's just the, the kind of recipe that you're introducing them to. But they, they imagine it that like you're kind of injecting, you know, illness and it's kind of building up. So now you've had 30 injections. And this is why, like, when you hear a Huberman talking about, you know, how yeah. many... How many vaccinations are, are too many? Yeah. like Yeah, which ones are harmful? And so on. And you're just like, he doesn't understand basic like he's got almost like anti-vaccine heuristics in his mind and that's that should be a warning sign from somebody who's supposed to be you know like a medical yeah expert so and, yeah and so yeah like you don't have to be like we're not absolutely you know we've probably made <laughs> mistakes in inaccuracies in, in our little potted summary here and that's that's fine i think that we got the gist right but like you don't have to be like a super duper professional in order to benefit hugely from a bit of general knowledge um, at, at the right level across these fields because you can then notice when people like Huberman are, are saying stuff and it just it's like hang on that's that, that's that, yeah what <laughs> that's, that, that's the wrong way to look at it so yeah yeah that is, that is it, it's a good I, I think you know in some respects it's tangential to the topic of the the show but in other respects it's not it's a it's this is exactly the opposite of what we want to emphasize is like bad junk food information. This is good, wholesome information that Matt and I both really enjoyed, yep. as you can probably tell by by this. So, yep. you know. Yeah, it's healthy for your mind. One, because it's just an intrinsically fascinating topic, just, just like many yeah. others. Um, and it's just great to learn about in and of itself. That's full stop. But, you know, I think there's an, there's an extra benefit in, in just having that general knowledge and learning about this topic, but also about this, this other topic in history or this other topic in sociology or yeah. this other topic in neuroscience or physics for that matter, because all of that informs a kind of general knowledge. Which, yeah. Yeah. Which I think just, I don't know, it's, it's like, it, it just, it, I think it does kind of strengthen your immune system generally in being able to smell bullshit. Yeah, yeah, I, I agree. And I, I think the last point I'll make about it is that the other thing that it would make clear to you is that you should not expect things to be 100%, to never have negative side effects for people to all respond the same because... There's so many complex mechanisms that basically everything has the potential to to go wrong or to cause some you know problem, and that is just the nature of being a biological entity like we are. Yeah, a very complex system. Yeah. Yeah, there are foods that we all eat that some people eat, and it triggers an allergic reaction and can kill them, right? And it it doesn't mean that we don't have to be concerned about allergic reactions, but just it's more like you have to accept with biological processes that are always trade-offs or always, you know, things that can go wrong. And so with vaccines, there will be people that have, you know, strong reactions. There will be in, in some extreme cases, and you would want this to not be the case as far as possible. 
there can be cases where people's reactions are so extreme that they die, right? Now, that is very rare uh, with the COVID vaccines, and given the amount of billions of people, despite what the people have claimed. But it, it's unavoidable. Like, mm. And that's the thing. And the one thing that the book will help you realize is just like why you don't want the infection to be the thing which is training your immune system if you can avoid it. <laughs> because like if your choice is infection versus vaccine, the infection always has the much more dangerous capacity because yeah. Yeah. it's uh, yeah, it's just doing a lot more damaging things. And it has the potential to overwhelm your immune system where essentially vaccines that are much more tightly controlled in the way that they're introduced and whatnot, and people are monitored immediately after they get them and whatnot, they they have a very, very reduced chance to trigger anything like that. So, you know, it's always going to be trade-offs involved, but this would help you understand why vaccines are yeah. almost always worth the trade-off. Yeah, this, this is where statistical thinking comes in and why everyone should try to <laughs> take an introductory course in statistics because you do need to wait. Things are not always black and white where option A is perfectly good, option no. B is, is very bad. You, you've, you've got two options. They, they always will, when, when the system is complex, there's going to be some, some shade of gray. Um, and, and what you need, and, and if you just go, well, if you think qualitatively and think, well, I, I could have a reaction to the vaccine and, and I could die, or I could die from getting the coronavirus, then those two things are sort of sit equally in your mind as if they're two equally, they're both bad and they're both possibilities. And qualitatively, they feel to you like they have, should have the same weight. But if, if you look at the statistics, like reliable ones, not some cherry picked nonsense off Twitter, um, then you'll see that the, the 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 risk for door B and the risk for door A are vastly vastly different, and um, you know you just have to think probabilistically um, when mm. you're making choices about like this. Yeah, anyway, well, it's good, good, good. I said so. You know, <laughs> like we don't do very much you know, or any really requested for promotions, but in this case. We have no relationship with Curtis Cassack uh, or Philip Detmer, but it's a fantastic book. I encourage anybody to read it, or at least the videos on the channel. They've got plenty of videos showing these processes. Those are great. And, you know, I just encourage anybody to... Yeah. to for, all, for all you lazy, <laughs> illiterate bastards out there, you can watch the videos, <laughs> but you really should read the book. Uh, but, 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 or the but, audiobook. <laughs> Listen to the audiobook. Seem the reader from the videos is the one who reads the audiobook. So that's that's great. So this is a this is a long endorsement of the book, but hopefully you got some other stuff out of that. And you know, people are always asking us, what do we promote? You know, we're always criticizing. What do we we yeah. promote stuff like this? Immune, yeah. a good uh, receives the the code in the guru's stamp of approval. Yep, certified fresh. Uh, uh, Bam, done. Thank you, Chris. Well, All right, I'll get back to my day doing doing hard science, and you will too. You've yeah. got you've got a paper to write. Quite right. I always do. I always do. All right. I will see you soon enough. Ciao.